ever seen anybody with a gleaming, glorious, shining face, a face that is beaming with the very presence of God, a face that is shining from the very power and love of God, a face that is shining with the love of God. I have many times. There have been times when I've participated in Holy Communion and people have come forward to receive and I look in their faces and I see a sense of being in the immediate real presence of Jesus or communing you at the rails here. And I look down after having communed you and notice that as you're praying, a look of contentment, a, a look of peace, a look of joy seems to be shining forth, beaming forth from your face. This shining light of God. We've all seen it. I was thumbing through some photographs from many years ago on my computer and I came to a set of photographs that were taken at Easter in the year 2007. That was the last Easter that my dad was alive. And these photographs were taken for me by a member of the church at First Methodist in Seagoville. And he was taking photographs during the worship service and during the closing hymn, he was taking photographs of the congregation as they were singing. And in the collection I found two photos of my mother and my dad. And as far as we can tell, these are probably the last two photographs of my dad taken of him while he was alive. And they're singing the closing hymn and they're sharing the hymnal and dad is intent on the words as he's singing and I can also see in his face a degree of pain because at that point in his life, every single waking moment hurt. And then I looked at mother and mother was singing with her hand upraised. Must have been Victory in Jesus, the closing hymn that Sunday. And, and she's singing, and I notice on her face is this beatific bliss. This look of knowing the immediate love, the immediate presence, the immediate perfect peace of Jesus. In that moment together, even with dad's pain, they, worshiping together the last time they would be in church together, mother was in heaven. I could see it on her face in those pictures. And I must say that for the six years that have passed since that time, I had not seen that look in her face again. I had not seen her beaming. I had not seen the love of God shining forth from her face that way until last month, right here, when I had the joy of baptizing not only my niece, Jaden, but my brother as well. And as I poured water over my brother's head and baptized him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I caught a glimpse of my mother out of the side of my eye. And the look on her face was that same expression, the beaming joy of God, the, the shining light of the love of God, the, the perfect peace of God's presence, knowing that in that exact moment, for a fleeting instant at least, she was shining forth with the presence of Jesus Christ. Yes, indeed. We can know that immediate presence of Almighty God. We can experience that immediate presence of Jesus. We can shine forth to others the beauty of the love and the presence of God. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai. He has the two tablets of the law with him. And his face is glowing. His face is shining. His face is beaming with the radiance of the glory of God. And the people are terrified of it. And so he puts a veil in front of his face so that they won't be afraid, so they can hear the law read without being terrified. They can experience and, and hear the words of Yahweh their God. 
And then he goes back up the mountain, he takes the veil off. Or when he goes into the Holy of Holies and stands before the Ark of the Covenant, he takes the veil off so he can stand in the unveiled presence of Almighty God and know the abiding and dwelling love, the perfect love and peace of God. This perfect love and peace is a perfect love and peace that we can all experience. No. No. We'd rather keep God at arm's length distance. We'd rather keep God far away from us. We know how much of a sinner we are. We know how much we fail in what God wants us to do. We know how much we need to be protected from the majesty and power and wrath and righteousness of God. Stay away. Keep Him at arm's length. Play hide and seek. Anything but embrace anything but come near to God. That's the way in which our culture seems to communicate it. That's the way the church seems to communicate it down through the centuries. God is to be held at distance. God is to be held away from you. Because if you get too close to God, you're liable to get blown away. Or more likely, if you get close to God... If you come near to God, if you approach Jesus, God will change you. If you come close to Christ, He will change you. If you come close to the glory of God, the glory of God will flow into you and you cannot help but be changed. So why do we hold God at a distance? Why do we sing songs like God is watching us from a distance? Nonsense! God's right here. God's in your immediate presence. If only you'll take the veil away and look and open your heart and receive and open your hands and give. God's right here. That's what Paul is saying in the second letter to the Corinthians here in chapter 3. Only in Christ is the veil set aside. Indeed, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. That seems a little bit harsh, but what he's saying is, is that the Jews, when they hear the law of God read, when they hear the Torah read, they are cowering in fear of this God and of the law because they know they can't complete it. They know they can't keep it. They know they are imperfect. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. There's no longer a need for a barrier between you and God because of Jesus. There's no longer a need for a veil or a shield between you and the Creator because of what Jesus has done for us. There's no longer need to keep God far away. Now the Lord is Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Not freedom to sin, freedom to live. Not freedom to go astray, but freedom to follow Christ. Freedom to have faith. Freedom to live by grace. Freedom to follow the will of God as God leads. Now the the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. If we are willing to approach the Lord in faith and depend upon His grace and not upon our own works, depend upon His love and not our own perfection, depend upon His peace and not our own will, if we're willing to approach the Lord in faith leaning on His grace and face the Lord of love, then we will, when we look in the mirror, 
see reflecting from us that very glory, that very grace, that very presence, that beaming bliss of Jesus that can shine forth from us when we are transformed, when we are changed, when we are perfected in love in Christ. Oh, Greg, come on. There's no way we can possibly ever become perfect. There's no way we can in this life ever possibly become perfect. You're right. In this life, in this world, in these skins, we can't be, by our own will, our own power, our own strength, perfect. The instant you think you can, you failed. But... It is possible to know that perfect love of God. Just like Moses, who, by the way, wasn't perfect when he appeared before Yahweh, wasn't perfect when he came down from Mount Sinai. He may have been glowing with the presence of God, but he himself wasn't perfect. But the perfect love of God was reflecting from him and shining to the people of Israel. Likewise also, we, though we are imperfect, can receive the perfect love of God, can experience the perfect love of God, and can shine forth, reflect to others that perfect love of God so that they can know and feel and experience the presence of God. This is known in Methodism as the doctrine of sanctification, where we are accepted as we are. Sinners deserving punishment, Sinners deserving, deserving death, and Jesus dies for us. And we are considered not guilty because of what Jesus does for us. But Jesus doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us as fallen sinners, but declared not guilty. Instead, He, through living with us, living within us, teaching us, guiding us, slowly takes us and slowly step by step sometimes crawling sometimes inching often going backwards and then forwards again slowly step by step in our lives if we read the scriptures and if we partake of holy communion if we worship together and sing hymns of praise and pray and then when we stop doing that, we find ourselves going backwards because we start again worshiping. And as we slowly move through our lives, God slowly, inch by inch, takes us from having been sinners, not knowing the grace of God, not knowing the perfection of God, not knowing the love of God, slowly over time takes us to knowing the perfect peace and love of God. Yes, in this life and then completely and unending in the life yet to come. We begin over there. And if we do nothing to live by faith, if we don't partake of the sacraments, if we don't partake of the means of grace, if we don't attend worship, we don't sing praises, we don't pray, we don't read Scripture, we don't listen to the sermons, we don't partake of the Holy Eucharist, we don't remember our baptisms, we don't serve others in the name of Christ, if we just sit there, we'll go nowhere. But if we'll get up and step out in faith and move forward and strive by grace, living by faith, we can over time, bit by bit, come into greater and greater degrees of the glory of God. That's what Paul is saying right here. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed. Notice the part of speech here, the tense. Are being transformed. It's something that continues. It's not something that ends. We don't get transformed and then we're done. This life, we're constantly being transformed. Are being transformed into the same image the same image? What image? The image of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. What? Yes. From one degree of glory to another. 
slowly, bit by bit, by no merit of our own, only by God's grace when we step out in faith, as we step out in faith again and again and again with each and every step of faith, slowly we are transformed into greater and greater likenesses, greater and greater image of Jesus Christ and His love for all. Now, this even makes this Methodist uncomfortable because I know how far I've got to go. I mean, I've been in this for a while. I became a United Methodist in 1987. I was ordained in 1991, a deacon and an elder in 1994. You know, I've been in it for a while. And part of me likes to think I'm, you know, oh, I don't know, maybe right over here. Maybe halfway there. No, there are times I wake up in the morning and I realize I might be a quarter of an inch forward from where I began. But that quarter inch is only there because of Jesus and because of His love, and because of His grace, and because He won't quit with me. Because I won't quit with Him. Then there are mornings when I wake up and I do feel like I've made some progress. And if I get proud of that, guess what? Whoops! I slide right back. Got to start over again. It's when I look in the mirror I've made some progress. And if I get proud of that, guess what? Whoops! I slide right back. Got to start over again. It's when I look in the mirror and realize that through no grace of my own, through no strength of my own, through no glory of my own, but only through God's grace, God's strength, God's glory, that I am where I am today, it is then and in that exact moment that I know the perfect love of God. And I've felt it many times. I've known it many times. Now when clergy are ordained, they stand before the bishop and are examined. And there are some classic historic questions that were asked. These questions have been asked of every elder who's been ordained, every presbyter, that's what elder means, The Greek word is presbyter. The English word is elder. In Roman Catholic Church, they call them priests. Every elder, every presbyter is asked the following questions. Have you faith in Christ? Oh, that's an easy one. You're supposed to say yes. If you can't say yes to that one, you might as well just go on home. Unfortunately, I know some elders who probably couldn't say yes for that, but that's no more. We'll cover that some other day. Have you faith in Christ? Yes. Are you going on to perfection? Ooh. Your answer is supposed to be yes. You are going on to perfection. That's what you're supposed to say. No matter how uncomfortable you may feel, that's what you're supposed to say. Because I'll give you an easy way to... This is a good argument to get through that one. You are going on to perfection by God's grace, by God's will, by God's strength. And you may not ever attain it in this life, but you can attain it over there. So you are going on to perfection. You were over there, and now you're a couple of inches further on the road. You're moving on, you're going on towards perfection. Still makes me uncomfortable. Third question. Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? I quit. (laughs) Question three gets me. Now, pay attention. It's not perfect. Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? I want to tell you something. While there are plenty of times, plenty of moments in my life, most of them, I'm afraid to say, where I'm not perfect in love, I can say that there have been times, have been moments in my life when I have known that through no merit of my own, in a fleeting instant, in an exact moment, like when I'm singing a hymn, like my mother singing Victory in Jesus on Easter Sunday, or 
in the monastery in Boston, standing before the altar at Holy Communion, receiving the grace of Jesus Christ in these means of grace, receiving the very presence of Jesus in the bread and in the cup. And in that exact moment for a fleeting instant, it's there and I know it, I experience it, I praise God for it. I know that I have been placed by God's grace in the perfect love of God. And for that instant alone, I know what heaven will be like. I know what glory will be like. For an instant, I know it. Standing up here, celebrating Holy Communion, there have been times when in the midst of the sacrament, I have known the perfect love of God. God's grace has shoved out of my heart, has pushed out of my soul every ounce of bitterness and anger and fear and disfaith and replaced it with the perfect love of God. And for an instant, I know and experience that presence of Jesus that beams forth, that presence of Yahweh that glowed from the face of Moses, that transfigured Jesus on Mount Tabor, and that we will experience unveiled for all eternity in heaven. Ooh, these are hard questions. Have you faith in Christ? Yes. Are you going on to perfection? Yes. Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? That way, the way I just talked about? Yes. By God's grace, I'll experience it again. By God's grace, you'll experience it again. Here's the fourth question. Are you earnestly striving after it? It's one thing to say, God, make me perfect in love in this life. But if you're not willing to do anything to respond to God's grace, you just want to sit over here and do nothing, you're going to get nothing. If you're unwilling to walk in faith, if you're unwilling to take that step, that first step of faith, if you're unwilling to take the second step of faith and the third step of faith and the fourth step of faith, you're going to get nowhere unless you're willing to strive after it. You must be willing to step out in faith. The rest of the questions kind of move into issues like doctrinal issues. And I don't want to go there today. I can't stand doctrinal issues. This one's hard enough. We are called to be ready and willing to allow God's grace to take us on, move us on, carry us on, sometimes dragging and kicking and screaming, but carry us on towards perfection. And we must be willing to strive for it and to be open to it. And to receive it when Jesus gives us those moments of knowing the perfect love of God in our lives. As we move into this week and through Ash Wednesday and on to the first Sunday of Lent, I call you to get off the starting block and to start moving on toward perfection in the love of God. Walking by faith. Embracing the means of grace. Worshiping together. Reading scripture. Praying. Praising. Partaking of the Eucharist. Serving the last and the least and the lost with a cup of water and a can of food. Doing what God calls us to do. Instead of playing hide-and-seek with Jesus, let's embrace Him and allow the love of God, the perfect love of God, to come into our lives 
and shine forth from us. Rip the veil away and allow the love of God to be seen and experienced reflecting from you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. have been listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of Northgate United Methodist Church and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2013 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information or to listen to other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at Northgate United Methodist Church, 3700 West Northgate Drive, Irving, Texas, 75062. This program was produced by Dr. Gregory Neal.